Hello and welcome back to What Is This Weapon? I'm Jonathan, and this is weird. I think you'll agree. Now this is the configuration we, we deliberately chose to put it in for our silhouette if you're over on social media playing along. Um, and if you're not, why not check it out? It's, uh, it's quite fun. <laughs> These episodes do stand alone, but um, if you <laughs> have the fun of guessing what it is, a lot of our, our fans do enjoy that. But we've been um, pretty tricksy this time because this is not the firing configuration for this weapon. This is the storage configuration or maybe the carriage configuration because it makes it very flat. Um, actually very flat for a, a pistol of this era. About 1875. It's a cartridge arm, uh, pin fire. I'll demonstrate that in a moment or in a little bit. So before I go too much further, let's show you. So we do need to, I suppose it's worth noting the trigger. This is a very, very steeply curved kind of Adams percussion revolver-esque trigger here. No trigger guard. And we don't have to pull it back, but I'm going to because it's going to slightly wear the muzzle of the first barrel. Ten barrels in this barrel cluster. Um, so slightly pull back the trigger, rotate to that position, rotate into the firing position. We then do need to pull back the hammer and click it into the first notch. And that <laughs> is our firing configuration on the first chamber. So very offset, very unusual. Now, this is in beautiful exterior condition, most likely because it was refinished by its former owners, the Renkin brothers in Belgium. Uh, possibly this was made in Belgium as well. Um, well, I'll fill you in on the on the designer in a moment, but uh, I didn't want to uh, get into that without showing you the mechanism. But it is the the hammer, the probably the um, the bent on the toe of the hammer is worn or broken, and it doesn't function in in double action, and it can't be cocked on single action either. So to try to show you how this works, I will have to kind of finagle. There we go. See how pulling the trigger has pulled it across to the second chamber, or barrel, and then the hammer would fall. So I'll try to show you again. Sec third, third barrel, hammer falls. So imagine I'm not using my thumb here to assist it. And we'll give it one more go. Over to the fourth. I don't want to do this any damage. There we go. Oh, <laughs> we've ratcheted over to our fifth barrel now. And actually, that was nearly holding on the on the sear, as it were, although it's actually a bent on the um, on the hammer. Anyway, so that's given us, that's got us halfway through our barrels there, which makes it a little bit more balanced and slightly less weird, but only slightly. <laughs> Truly bizarre bit of kit. Uh, called by collectors a harmonica pistol. I don't have any evidence that that was a period name for it um, in French or English, but you can see why, because it, it does, especially with the barrel unlatched from the frame, it really does look like a harmonica or maybe a maybe some pan pipes. No, I'm not going to attempt to play it. Um, I have been asked already. <laughs> not going to happen. So there is more to this, though. So if we manually pull the hammer back and manually pull it all the way back to the pivot point here, that's the pivot, these two lugs, one either side, catch it in the frame and then it pivots on those. Let me show you that from this angle. So it's held on those lugs, unless it's in that configuration, and then with the hammer back, we can lock it into its first firing position. Now, what that also means is, if we orientate the lugs correctly, it just pops off. So there's no latch required, what there is, if you can see it, is a track with a sort of indent at one end. It's on both sides of the frame, top and bottom. And the lugs are oval, sort of like a squarish oval shape, which means that when they're in the, they slide in the track and then when they rotate, the whole thing is locked in place, cannot come out the front. But as soon as you rotate it, it can just slide out. So quite a, an elegant, simple design, really. Um, no latch required. Where there is a latch required, 
is for loading, because this is, as I mentioned, pin fire, has a series of pin holes in the top of the barrel cluster. Um, oh, and I should point out, these are your ratchet lugs. So they're, they're analogous to the cuts on the back of a, of a revolver cylinder that are pushed up by the pawl or the hand of a revolver. This works just the same way. Behind the track that the barrel locks into is another track for that row of lugs to, to slide in. And that little pull that acts sideways, not vertically like a revolver, drags the whole barrel unit one step to the left, one step to the left, each time you pull the trigger. So it's really awkward to see in there, but there'll be an angle where you can see the pull acting. So that's, that's how it operates. Uh, but to return to loading, you can't get, and I have an inert pin fire. This is seven millimeter pin fire, by the way. We have an inert round. For those of you who have not seen pin fire before, it's an 1860s system where the pressure sensitive compound is inside the, the head of the case, not around the rim like rim fire or in the center in a cap like center fire. It's in a little pocket in the middle and a little anvil like um, almost like a cartoon detonator system. The, the hammer is completely flat. This one's actually not completely flat because it has to get in, it has to lock into the notch to, to help with operation. Normally they are completely flat. Um, but so it's the central raised portion of that that slaps down onto your pin, which goes into the case, fires the essentially the cap or the, or the compound that's inside and fires the cartridge. All sorts of things made in pin fire from shotguns to pistols. Um, popular system for, for quite some time, but clearly inferior to rim and center fire in the long run. Now, the catch I mentioned earlier is a catch here. So presses in and that lets you, a little bit awkward to do on camera. There we go. So press in and then your cartridge retainer drops down. It's almost like a piano lid kind of setup. And with that open, you can see all the little notches for the pins across the top there. We can also see Belgian proof marks. So yeah, unless this was made in France, shipped to Belgium for proofing, which is unlikely, this was indeed made in Belgium. So the key one there is the oval ELG. That's pre-1894 Belgian proof. So just to show you how that works, drop in our seven millimeter pin fire round. Now this is marked with a little seven, so you know what caliber it is. If you're running multiple different pin fire firearms, which is quite nice, they don't always have that. So you'd need 10 of these, you drop them into there, they're just a drop in, there's no, no real friction required there, they, they load easily. And then when you close this over the round, there we are, it's clipped in. And you can see our little copper pin is protruding through that little aperture there where that funny shaped hammer is gonna drop in, smack it and fire the round. So imagine if you will, <laughs> nine more of those. What else? Well, unloading. So when we fired all of our 10 shots or as many shots as we want to fire, we press the catch, we open the piano lid <laughs> and then if this case is expanded and is stuck, now black powder in these in these rounds, so more fouling, more chance of that being a bit stuck in there. So how do you bang out the, the empty case? Well, Mr. Jar, who's the uh, designer, uh, inventor of this thing, who I haven't mentioned yet, but I have now, has thought of everything. Pierre-Joseph Jar was his name. Unscrew this. and out pops your not quite patented pokey stick. And then if that was stuck, you just upend it. And I'll just, I'll just gently, I'll support this as it comes out. There we go. You just knock it out. It's just like the ejector rod on something like a single action army, but it's not built into the gun or a Webley revolver for that matter, uh, or a Belgian knockoff thereof just like a, a built-in ejector on, on a revolver, but it has to be kept separately, more like a ramrod for a cavalry pistol that might be tucked into the boot 
of the cavalryman in a 17th century context, uh, context say. And then you have to not lose that, otherwise reloading might become a bit tricky. Although you have got the, the, the knocked-in pin to get a purchase on to pull out the cases. So this shouldn't be strictly necessary, I wouldn't have thought. But it is there if you need it. Decoration, well, there isn't decoration. What there is is fluting, just like a revolver cylinder, to make this otherwise quite hefty barrel unit lighter. So just material removed in between each barrel to make it lighter. Um, it's, it's beautifully blued, but again, that's probably a refinish from the um, Rankin brothers, who were firearms dealers and collectors. End of the 19th century, they refinished most of their stuff. So it's, per it's period refinish. Walnut grips with checkering. Now, I mentioned um, Pierre-Joseph Jarre. His first patent is dated 1862, and is not this. It's a simpler system with a fixed barrel and a, and a sort of cassette uh, breach that slides through the same idea but with a fixed barrel so whether that's more more advanced or less is, is kind of up to you now that jar dies by 1883 by which point his sons are in the game and they patent this system the more, the more complex pivoting folding design without the fixed barrel now of course you couldn't really do that with a fixed barrel all you could do is take out the, the chamber cassette and store that separately. So the whole point of this was to have a single unit that folds for storage and carriage rather than needing to remove your breech block, which is otherwise sticking out the side and being rather awkward. Now, the 1862 patent shows a long gun, a rifle or a smoothbore. Uh, it's not clear, I don't think, from the patent. And they, the follow-up patent by the Sons, which uh, I think there's a British patent in 1871. There's certainly an American patent in 1873 that um, includes a pistol version. But there is a pistol version of the fixed barrel version by the dad from about 1862, because Walter Winant, whose Firearms Curiosa book, which is amazing, by the way, uh, out of print, but very good, he illustrates an antique example of um, the first patent from 1862. This is the 1871 slash 1873 patent. So we've dated this to around 1875. Uh, there is some confusion over the different jars here, so um, just be a bit wary of that. Uh, lots of similar names and lots of different guys in this gun-making family. These do show up for auction from time to time, um, but they are pretty rare overall. We don't know how many were made. We have no idea how practical they may or may, or may not have been, except, of course, just from informal assessment as we do in these videos. And I'm not wildly convinced. It's fun, it's interesting. It's 10 shots, which is good for the size, you know. To make a 7mm revolver, I don't think you'd easily get 10 shots in it. And if you did, it would be quite bulky to carry around. Whereas this thing does have that advantage of storing flat. However, if you're carrying it around like this in a vest pocket and a foot pad sets upon you, you've got to draw it successfully without snagging it. Um, turn, turn pull the hammer back and lock it in, by which time he's probably robbed you, uh, including of your pistol. So, not wildly successful, as a lot of things on this <laughs> series aren't, but um, incredibly cool and um, really nice to take an in-depth look at with you today. Thanks for watching, guys. Hope you enjoyed this one. Um, as always, you can play along over on Facebook or Instagram, guessing what it is that we're going to end up revealing on the video series, or you can just carry on watching just the videos. We don't really mind which you do. Uh, also, check out our website, um, any events that we happen to, to have coming up. At the moment, the main thing is our exhibition Reloaded, which is a temporary exhibition featuring decorated firearms of, well, all eras really, but there's some, some pretty pretty interesting stuff in there. Gold-plated Kalashnikov, uh, there's a gold sterling as well, for those of you who aren't so interested in the uh, AK side of things. The Art Deco Baby Browning that we covered the other, the other week on the channel, and a lot more side so please do come and check that out it's on until the end of june that's if you're in the uk of course in any case we thank you again for watching the series and we'll see you again next week